You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. This podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, telling Oklahoma stories through its people since 1927. Follow them online at oklahomahof.com and definitely on Instagram at oklahomahof. Let's get into today's episode. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode in Oklahoma City today on, well, probably the day you're listening to this, it's hopefully not going to be gloomy and raining, but the day that we're recording, it hasn't stopped raining for, I mean, at least two days, which I guess is good for the farmers and good for my green grass in my yard. It makes me look like a much better homeowner than I actually am. But with me today, I have uh, David Woods, who, I mean... I'm going to do an introduction before this so you can listen to his bio because it's very long and, and there's a lot that we can talk about today. But um, David, thanks so much for having me at the office. Excited Thank to talk you. about McGowan Partners, um, Cortado Ventures, and all of the other cool stuff you've done. Traveled the world with Ditch Witch, which kind of I heard about previously when you did um, uh, a talk down at Starspace for one of the coffee mornings. Um, but before we get into all that, I guess tell us kind of about current state of the union. What what like what takes up most of your day? To, you know, at the moment. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. I, I think we chatted when you walked in that it must be a slow day for you if you're coming and chatting. <laughs> Not with me. at all. But uh, um, yeah, life's uh, doing really well right now. Both our companies are doing really well. Uh, you know, our family outside of a tragedy a couple of years ago is doing really well. And I have my first granddaughter showing up in about another 30 days. So uh, that I probably should have started with that because that's certainly my number one <laughs> priority right now. Ready to be a granddad. That's uh, that's exciting. And that's uh, totally different, I guess, uh, stress maybe. And I mean, it probably puts things into perspective. You, you come to work and you might have a hard day at work and you go home and see that smiling grandbaby. Like, yep. Nothing matters. I, I can't wait. Yeah, I that's awesome. Wait. So starting out then, um, you know, you've kind of now you're kind of in a leadership role and, and, and a lot of you know teaching leadership tactics and, and even the talk that I heard you give was a lot about networking um, due to kind of like the, the business that you're in and you traveled so much around the world but take me back like what's kind of like your origin story where did you grow up um, you know and kind of how do you get into business from from a young age yeah so I was uh, an Air Force brat so my dad uh, spent his whole career in the Air Force retired as a two-star general in fact this is his, uh, these are the flags that were in his general's office when, uh, when he, after he retired and he's passed away, but uh, I inherited the flag, so that it's fairly special to me. Uh, but I was born in Germany when he was stationed there, mm-hmm. uh, left six months later, so I don't really remember that sort of on my bucket list to go back to Landstuhl, Germany, where I was born. Yeah. Um, and then so we traveled. We moved about every 18 months growing up, and I landed here in Oklahoma when Dad was a commander up at Vance Air Force Base in Enid mm-hmm. and uh, fell in love with Oklahoma. Uh, and it was that teenage years where I don't know what it was. Every other place we went I, I enjoyed, but there was something about Oklahoma at that time I really enjoyed the most. He got uh, stationed down in Del Rio, Texas, mm-hmm. which was... Uh, not my favorite place to be for a year. Uh, and then he got stationed back in Vietnam. And uh, my mom came in, it's one of those, and everybody has these these moments in life where you just make a snap decision and it changes the whole trajectory of your life. So she walked in, we'd loved living in Virginia, we loved living in Arizona and a couple other mm-hmm. places that we really enjoyed. And she said, you know, your dad's going to Vietnam, your brother's already in college, it's just me and you. We can go anywhere you want, where do you want to go? And I go, I wanna go back to Oklahoma. And it was that, it was literally a 30 second conversation. And she goes, okay. So we moved back here, three days later I met the gal I've been married to for 44 years. So it, again, one 30 second conversation. I could have said Arizona or Virginia just as easy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, anyway, and then I uh, was supposed to go to, uh, the Air Force Academy I was going to follow in Dad's footsteps a little bit, and uh, but by then I'd really fallen in love, and my girlfriend at the time, now wife, was uh, a year younger, mm-hmm. and so when it came time to go to college, I'm like, "Ooh, Colorado's a long way from Enid, Oklahoma." So then I was going to go to Westminster over in Missouri. That even seemed too long, so 
I chose Oklahoma State because of its proximity to Enid, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And I remember my dad going, geographic location is a piss poor reason to pick a college. And like, I know dad, but that's all I got. <laughs> and so, yeah. uh, and so I did that and I actually really enjoyed Oklahoma State and uh, got out of there. My wife and I, by then we were like East Coast, West Coast. That's kind of typical, probably Oklahoma kid, you know, Let, let's get out of Oklahoma thing. And a buddy of mine's dad worked at Ditchwich and he goes, you know, they're interviewing. So I went over there and I, I can't even explain it. Just sort of like pulling up in the driveway, I go, I can't explain it, but this is where I want to go to work. So I sort of canceled all my other interviews and focused so, solely on seeing if I could get on there. And I did, I was 23 and uh, yeah. spent 23 years there and fortunately had the opportunity later in life to, mainly because just great people around me that helped me so much yeah. were just this beautiful infrastructure of friends and smart people that helped me yeah. and uh, getting to run it that last few years was just a blast but that's sort of career one and then right career two's now been uh, not doing that so. yeah 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 spending so much time on a plane you know 40 countries I think right is the stat that the ditch which is in or they have dealerships yep. in yep. I guess. yeah I've, I've that's probably about right. I, yeah. I don't remember the exact stat, but that's probably about right. About 120 locations around the world. Yeah. And uh, and it was a blast. I mean, you know, when you're younger and you're flying around and right. visiting all parts of the world, and uh, it, it was just an absolute blast. Yeah. yeah, it kind of probably complements and ticks the boxes of everything you thought you would have done in the Air Force. Right? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Tra I love trap. That's I never thought of it that yeah. way, but that's exactly what... Uh, I enjoyed the most about it was seeing all different places and and later in life I got we had a corporate jet so I got to see it it's it, sort of yeah. like what do you miss the most about Ditchwich I'm like that was at the yeah. top I'm no TSA just gonna, <laughs> exactly. no lines no waiting the plane is waiting on me <laughs> exactly. rather than, rather than exactly. me waiting on it which yes no doubt is is for sure plus yeah um so when you go to osu before you get to ditchwich when you go to osu what was your without you know not going into the air force what was your kind of decision and, and what were you going to study well i was in business mm -hmm. and then uh when i was younger i was very involved in boy scouts and i thought well i want to go be a there's actually a career you mm -hmm. can be a professional boy scout you know and uh so i thought about doing that i started looking at all the curriculums at OSU and I mm -hmm. found one that I thought well that would sort of fit if I wanted to go into Boy Scouts and the degree was in uh, recreational science and so I changed I went to recreational science and I called my dad and said I've changed majors to recreational science and he goes no you didn't <laughs> And had one of those father-son chats. It was <laughs> fairly one-sided. And so the next day, I went back and changed it over to business, yeah. back into business management, and graduated with that. I, I did you know the classic, yeah. six years to get a four-year degree. But uh, but my wife and I worked the whole right. time. So yeah. And now, I mean, you you know, there's there's so many great. Um, you know, Oklahoma State alumni, CEOs, uh, one of them that comes to mind, I interviewed Ban, uh, Ban Wynn, who, who runs Jimmy's Egg. Oh, um, yeah. And, you know, he kind of, he went, did the same route, went to OSU and, and has been back to talk to the business school. And, and there's many others that have, I, have not been on the podcast and some that have, but just that community of Oklahoma State, um, I think in the past of all the interviews I've done, I've interviewed more Oklahoma State alums, I think, than OU alums. I know it's just a little different. Um, yeah, well, I might be a little biased because I'm know, no Oklahoma State it, it fan. It is but. interesting. Of course, you're not originally from not here. Not from here, no. Uh, there's something about me when I moved here. I didn't get into the, uh, I mean, I'll joke about it, but I don't really, I don't have a deep feeling about the banter between OU, OSU, mm -hmm. or any other college, TU, UCO, any of those. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get into the banter about Oklahoma City, Tulsa. Mm -hmm. thing I'm just like this is just a great place you know I don't care what college you went to or what city you live in this is just a great place so I've always been a little bit uh, in the middle on that now having said that I love OSU I mean we've had a great relationship from a business standpoint I'm very uh, we've done a lot of work with them as we have with other colleges but it's it's weird I tell them every time I do any work I go, please don't look at my transcript because uh, 
you would not be hiring yeah. Magellan if it was if it was that. Yeah, that's a great point though, isn't it? Because of the years that you know, people there's people graduating now that you know, like they just they still don't know what they wanted to do. I mean, I'm kind of 31 and I still kind of have an idea of what I want to do, but you know, a new shiny opportunity might come around the door or something hits you in something different life and you go off on a different path. But, yep. you know, like the journey that you've taken over the last, I guess, you know, 20, 23 years, right, at Ditchwich and, and all the, you know, to go where you're at now, you probably never would have thought you were going to be there. But when you pull up to Ditchwich, you know, like something clicks, right? And this is a place yep. I'm going to be. And then you go in and that culture over the years, you know, you, you progress and, and move up. And right. like I said, you end, up, you end up, you know, at the top of the tree with making decisions and right. traveling around the world. Yeah, yeah. It was, it, you know, a uh. lot of green lights hit, you know, so it was a, it was a fun ride. And, uh, and since I left, you know, I left 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a fun ride since then, you know, knock on yeah. wood. Yeah. So, so what, what kind of after... You know the time at Ditchwich and, and learning so much and getting into leadership. What was that switch that when you were kind of towards the end and you think, ah, oh, okay, I'm done now. I want to go do something else. Yeah. Why not go run a different company? Why go into leadership stuff as well? Because because there's a lot of stuff that you teach now right. based on leadership and how companies should structure and culture and yeah, uh, uh, there's so a service element to it. A couple aspects of that. First of all, when you work for a company as great as Ditchwich was. Um, the idea of going somewhere and sort of replicating what you just did, you're like, I was already at a great company. It can't get any better, right? Mm -hmm. And that was sort of my feeling. Uh, the second part was, uh, maybe it's ego. I don't know what it is. I always wanted to own my own company. That was never going to be my company. It was a great family that owned it. And uh, so, and the other thing that happens, all of us, when, once you hit, I don't know what age, 40-some years old, you start sort of figuring out, I'm not very good at these things, but I'm pretty good at these things, right? Mm -hmm. And that sort of hit me. Um, I would have never guessed I was pretty good at strategy and some things like that. And uh, so my days at Ditchwich, we were sort of stuck on, I don't know, 120 million for many, many years. And not me, but the team around us when we kind of got where we were driving things a little bit. Uh, we were kind of like, okay, how do you get 1,600 employees all on the same page to drive something? And that's when I became just a passionate student of strategy. And so we kind of figured it out, and uh, we grew from 120 million to 350 million in about five years. Yeah. And that's when I went, oh, that was fun. And secondly, you only do strategy once a year. I'm like, I'd love to do that every day. And so that was part of what you know, wanting to own my own company, feeling really comfortable with the idea of helping people with strategy, having enough relationships around the world to maybe be a foundation for some of that. Mm -hmm. And so I made made the leap and scary as hell because that first three years, you know, I lost about a half a million dollars and, and I did not have a half a million dollars to lose. And so I only had about 300,000 to lose and lost all of that. Mm -hmm. And so, but I find most people in leadership roles, if they haven't been to hell and back, they're probably not as good a leader. And so I wear that a little bit as like, yep, been there, right? I know what that's like. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and most great leaders, if you get them to be a little bit transparent, they've got stories like that where they just, and you can't quite explain what happened or how it happened or any of that. But, uh, you know, once you, you just sort of reset Okay, that's not working the way it's doing. Let's switch. And finally, things really started, you know, probably about 18 years ago, 17, 18 years ago, it started really clicking. And we've been building this and then subsequently Cortado ever yeah. since. So. Yeah. It's fascinating. I mean, it's, you no, know, nothing ever was it. Nothing worth doing is ever easy, right? You know, when you right. go through it and, you know, part of you sometimes was probably come home and thinking, I don't want to feel defeated, but that someone, you know, was there any opportunities as you were building this that a corporate job was like, hey, I know, like, this isn't going well, come over here, and there's yes. a part of you that didn't give up, but I'm fascinated to know why. Um, it, probably the same reason, you know, I did get courted really heavily by one mm -hmm. organization, you know, they came and picked me up on their corporate jet and took me to their location and kind of wined and dined me for a couple of days, and I kind of looked around, and I'm like, I've already done this. 
it was a you know it was literally like stepping away from one thing and other than maybe the colors on the walls it, it was kind of the same thing and I'm like that's not that's not what I want to do and so I say stuck to my guns and kept going with what I'm going and I don't it'd be really hard to pull me out of what I'm doing right now I've had so much fun so. yeah tell me a little bit about kind of like the kind of family and relationship dynamic when you're going through a tough time at work because that's a lot of things that the really people don't really talk about much is like you know you're building a company and just to have that support of your family your wife and and gary brooks spoke about it previously was just you know when you're taking on something of such a massive scale and it's not going to plan right you know just relying and having that base of a foundation does you yeah. wonders how was it in your kind of when you were going through those first couple of years of, of building out yeah oh my wife's a rock star so she was a rock star you know living in perry oklahoma right i mean you you have to understand i'm in my early days, I would travel out for two weeks, not not come home, like out, including the middle weekend, for two weeks, and I'd come home for two weeks. Travel out for two weeks, come home for two weeks. And in those days, they were very strict. You could you had to leave on a Sunday, and you couldn't come back until two weeks later on a Saturday morning. Yeah. And they were really, really strict about that. I, I will tell you, when I finally got in a position where I could change that, we changed that. And, and it came from somebody missed the birth of their child oh, from geez. that really strict thing. I'm like, that's never going to happen under my guard so, or under my watch. So anyway, um, she raised our children, you know, in that environment. And uh, so little tiny town, not much to do, raising two kids, me gallivanting all over the place, you know, doing those call-ins every night at the end of a long day. Yeah. And so she's a rock star. And then when we started here, uh, she stayed by my side the whole time. We, we went to hell and back, right? Help. She's really good with uh, our personal financial stuff. And so, you know, she's the one like, we're going to have to downsize. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, my ego wouldn't let me do that. But she was right. And we did. And, you know, kind of that kind of that thing where we just yeah. started building it back and Last November, we just bought a second home at a lake house. And so Damn. I'm like, okay, finally, <laughs> finally, you know, 20 years later, but we're really enjoying it. And I and I wear that with some pride, you know, the fact that I went through all that. So. Yeah, yeah, because in, in the work business that you do now, you can relate so much to people and they can relate to you. And it's not you just coming in saying, I, I crushed life, I've done this, I've, I've right. wanted everything I've looked at. I've had a lot of green lights. And, you know, that doesn't do you any good when you're trying to no. teach someone who's in the depths and struggling and yeah. doesn't see the light and there was a point at, at Ditchwich where the whole market collapsed mm -hmm. I mean not just Ditchwich I mean the whole market collapsed and almost everybody that was in our industry their business dropped by half in about a six month period the company never had a layoff oh. well guess who's sitting at the helm when that moment hit and I remember having these computer printouts laid across my desk. I'm sitting in there literally for days just trying to find nickels and dimes to not have to have a layoff. And it was actually the owner that walked in and he, you know, we'd become good friends by that time. He just walked in and goes, it's time. And that's all he had to say. I knew what it meant. He knew what I'd been doing. And so to lay off 600 people in a town of 5,000, it, that will change your life, you know, it will change your life. And f to your point, uh, when I'm talking to uh, CEOs or senior execs or whatever about the drama of, you know, I tell people all the time, it's, it can be really ugly at the top because mm -hmm. you're having to make some decisions that you don't even want to make, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, but you kind of have to, you know. Yeah. Yeah, because you're going to the grocery store or the gas station and you're seeing people directly impacted from a decision you've just made. Oh, God, I right? can't believe you brought that up. Because like, in a town like that, you, know, you lay off 600, you, yeah. I'd be in Walmart going down the aisle and going, they'd see somebody coming at me and I'm going, I don't know if you're still working here or you got laid off. I mean, I, you just you couldn't memorize 600 right. yeah, people, right? And uh, it, it was hard. It yeah. was really, really hard. Uh, in fact, my wife and I were supposed to between us we had decided we were going to leave and and start doing what i'm doing now and then that hit mm -hmm. and i told her i said I, I can't leave 
I said, if I leave now, it looks like, oh, it got hard and you quit. Mm -hmm. And just my personal being, I'm like, I can't do that. And so we stayed uh, through all of that and then uh, spent about another year getting it back in the black. Mm -hmm. And once it was felt like it was in the black and there to stay, yeah. that, that's when I left. So it sort of delayed the leaving a yeah. couple of years. But, but again, I've... Uh, I hated going through that, but in hindsight, I'm going, I learned a lot, you know? No. Quite honestly, laying people off is a skill. Mm -hmm. You can do it really poorly, or you can do it with heart and help, you know, do whatever you can to help people. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, those are just skills you, you need to know as a leader. Yeah. Because you never know when you're going to be thrown into that. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. Where does the name come from? Where does Magellan Partners come from? Well, for a number of years, we were with an organization called Giant. I was okay. yeah. one of three partners, and uh, and we had several entities under there. I think at one point we had five. I think mm -hmm. I think we ended up with about three. Uh, there was Giant Capital, Giant Impact, Giant Partners, and the partners part was the part I was doing. Mm -hmm. And we all thought, oh, this will be fantastic. We're going to leverage each other. Well, you fast forward, and we were three very separate entities under one umbrella mm -hmm. I was like eh, this is just not working so I finally just said guys we gotta let, let, let's split this up it ain't working the way we thought it would they're all great guys it's not nothing about it Jeremy There's, right Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy and Matthew yeah. Myers mm -hmm. just great guys and and uh, Matthew from Edmund Matthew Myers mm -hmm. from Edmund yeah okay yep, both been on the podcast yeah. developer now yeah. yeah great great guys so anyway so then I said okay well, let's take what Giant Partners was and we'll rebrand it and we spent we must have looked at a thousand names, and there was something about Magellan, which is sort of fascinating if you, and I'm not a great historian, but I knew just enough. So Magellan was the first guy to, you know, go around the world okay. on, a, on a ship, yeah. right? Now what's interesting about that is he didn't survive. Okay. About three quarters of the way through, he got killed. But the journey was a success. And so when I think of working, talking to a CEO, sort of like, what are you doing that this entity will live on beyond you mm -hmm. and be successful beyond you? Yeah. And uh, somehow that sort of fits. Uh, Tony might, that, that's sort of it and sort of inspired me. And the, the logo is, you know, has all these little unique little meanings behind it and stuff. So anyway, yeah, it, I, I came up a little bit through the marketing side. So that was sort of just fun for me. Uh, I, I tell people all the time, don't don't get away from the parts of the business that you enjoy. Yeah. Because sometimes you can end up as an administrative leader, and you're miserable because you don't get to play in the stuff you enjoy playing in. And so I've always had a little bit of, I get enjoyment out of messing around with the marketing side. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting, isn't it? Because it, it's it's brand, it's it, it's personality, it's culture, it's everything that that makes the business what it is, yeah. isn't it? And I I love it too. I, I, I teach people all the time, employees and leaders, I go, you need to know what your boss's toys are. Mm -hmm. And that sounds weird, but back in my ditch witch days, I could make some pretty big decisions. Uh, I, I mean, I had a framework. I can make decisions up to, I don't know what it was, $500,000. I don't remember what the number was. And one time somebody said, hey, David, we need to put a door in the manufacturing plant just between two wall, two parts of the plant. Well, okay, it's a $500 door. I don't even know why he had to ask me, you know. Put the door in, about a week or two later, the owner walks in and goes, yeah, if you're gonna be putting doors in things, I need you to come talk to me. And I'm thinking, what, what? And I, I didn't, I was smart enough, I didn't like, yeah. go, you're an idiot. I was like, okay, there's a lesson here. And what I learned was he loved architecture. He loved planning the business, the, the buildings and mm -hmm. where we were going to expand and all of that. I mean, that was his toy. Yeah. And I'd taken his toy away from him. So it had nothing to do with he didn't like my decision. Yeah. I just took something away that he loved messing with. So from that moment on, every time I had anything to do with the building, I'd walk into his office. His name was Ed. I'd go, Ed, will you teach me how you think about this? Here's a recommendation that's come. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it was like Christmas morning to him. He'd, Put his arm around me if you knew him. He put his arm around everybody. Yeah. We'd walk out in the plant. We'd climb on the roof. He'd explain the history to me. 
mean, it was just beautiful. And yeah. so if you think about it, everybody has parts of the business that they love. And if you can learn that, if, if you're any any employee, mm -hmm. learn what your boss's toys are and make room for them to go do that. It's just a yeah. this group that I work with here knows what the toys are that I like the most. And so they'll kind of yeah. make room for me to play in that area. And, and they know what I don't want to do. And they'll yeah. sort of suck those things up so I don't have to because that's what will make a job miserable is if you're dealing, doing stuff you don't want to do every day. Right. Right. Yeah, because so. you start looking to looking elsewhere and you're not giving it right. your full focus. And it's fascinating that, you know, he was interested in architecture and the flow of traffic through the building. And, I mean, I, I understand it. It's not a huge passion of mine, but I can see yeah. why you can get passionate about it. And, and that can be flipped. Yeah. You know, I, I do the same thing any time. We don't do employee evaluations. We do employee thrive meetings, mm -hmm. which is their opportunity to kind of own their own career and things like that. And one of the questions I love asking, like, are, are you working on the stuff you want to work on? What else would you want to work on, right? right? And let them be in charge. And if we can fit that in, we'll fit it in, right? Yeah. Because that's what creates people that whistle going to work if you get let them do that. Yeah. Kind of switching a little bit of the yeah, the kind of focus, staying on, on Magellan, but talking a little bit about kind of Oklahoma-based companies and businesses that you've worked with. I mean, you have been in the business and, and just watched this city grow over the last 10, 15 years. I mean, it must be fascinating to, to still be here. And, and, you know, going back to that day where you chose to, you know, said to your mom, hey, I, I want to go back to Oklahoma. And now you've seen this city come from, you know, just oh, having yeah. Bricktown and being a ghost town down there and not being safe to go down to, I mean, thriving into even today's, you know, yeah. what it is now. But both my sons, when they got out of high school, mm -hmm. went to L.A. and they were in the film business. Okay. They were both out there about 10 years each. And uh, it was right at the time where maps had come on and all of that stuff. And then they they come back and they're both like, holy moly. You know, I mean, that sort of snapshot before and after mm -hmm. was pretty fun to watch. And, of course, that and they've been in Oklahoma for a while and it's grown at least double that from when they got mm -hmm. back. And uh, I, I absolutely love it. I love seeing uh, Oklahoma firms grow, mm -hmm. and uh, we get to go kind of be alongside a lot of them that are doing that. And it is, it, it just does your heart good. You know, we, we actually do work all over the North America. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, part of me is like, you guys just need to move to Oklahoma. Your life would be a lot easier here yeah. than, than where you are, because sometimes they're, where they are is, so regulated or whatever else it may be mm -hmm. and uh, this is just a great place for business yeah perfect to that point you know you you started cortado ventures recently because there was a clear need for that and, yep. and there's passionate people here who want to invest in something tell me a little bit about kind of what it is and, and why it was started and kind of i guess how it's been doing yeah um well for me personally it was actually a i think almost a funny story was i was reading one day this is probably I don't know, four or five years ago, and I read where most people make most of their real money between the ages of 50 and 75. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading that, and, and I've, I'm, I'm doing fine, but I thought I still haven't hit the nut of really what I wanted to achieve financially. Right. And I'm like, crap, I'm halfway through that. And so because I had enough business background, I said, okay, calm down, you know, look at David, look at the assets that you've got that you might be able to leverage. So one asset was we see a fair amount of deal flow here at Magellan. Now we can't work with, we don't work with startups typically, um, so, but it doesn't matter, they would still reach out to us. Mm -hmm. And then I had a, a variety of friends that would say, hey, if you ever see something worth investing in, let me know. Okay, so I'm like, okay, that's an asset and that's an asset. How do you put these together? And the answer is venture capital, of which I didn't know how to spell. And so I reached out to an old friend of mine, Mike Marotti. He and I spoke uh, just kind of back to back at a thing probably 10 years ago or more. And uh, we started chatting and he kind of had that. He was at a point where he kind of saw and felt the same thing and kind of wanted to do something. And so we had a couple of false starts trying to get that going. And then we met uh, Nathaniel Harding who's the third partner. And Nathaniel was like, I mean, it was like God opened up and said, here you go. 
and uh, it's just been phenomenal ever since. And uh, you know, we we said let's see if we can go raise ten million dollars. I will tell you, Oklahoma has so many entrepreneurs mm -hmm. that just didn't have a framework, a place to go, and we've got so many willing investors that just didn't have a place to put their money. Mm -hmm. They were going east coast, west coast, and the demand was so high. We we want to raise ten million in a year, and we raised. 20 million in six months. And we've already invested, uh, it's now, I'd say, about two years old. Um, we've invested in 24 companies. Uh, some, uh, there are, out of that, out of all of the, the last two years, we've only, only one has gone wrong. The others are doing really well. Some are doing, you know, we've got one I think will be what's called a unicorn. It'll hit a, it'll have a market cap of about a billion dollars here at some point. Yeah. So that's been exciting. Well, now we're out of that fund one. So we started fund two and we go, let's sort of reach for the moon. Most people to go from, they'll go from 20 million, let's do the next one at 30. Well, we said, let's, let's put the next one around 80 million. And in six weeks we had 20 million already oh my gosh. Uh, accounted for. And I mean that's that is a hundred percent demand. Yeah. You know, lots on. We're looking at five hundred deals per year. That's how much demand there is for investment in Oklahoma. Yeah. And a huge percentage of those are are here in Oklahoma. And then same thing with investors. You've got people going. I'm just glad there's a formal framework. Now. Mm -hmm. And believe me, I also this is a weird one. I don't believe in any co competition. I live competitive worlds mm -hmm. in my corporate days, so I don't believe in competition. And when we started Cortado, I said, we will have failed if in five years there aren't at least five other venture capital companies in Oklahoma, because in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. there's enough for everybody, and everybody has their own little thesis of how they, what they're going to invest in and type of investors they're looking mm -hmm. for. And uh, so I'm very excited to now start seeing other people get really interested in creating venture. Because guess what happens? You start bringing, now we have outside investors wanting to throw money at Oklahoma. And I don't know who needs to hear that, but it's pretty incredible to watch, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, it, no, it's fascinating, isn't it? And it, like, it was only a matter of time. And like I said, when you get the, you know, when you raise, you know, six months in, you raise $20 million, you're like, okay, there's a sign, yeah. you know? And then like I said, when you go again and, you know, oh, and also, I mean, just to speak to the, the businesses that you did invest in, I mean, only just, only to have one that didn't work out, that's pretty, so that's far. unheard of, right? And, you <laughs> right. know, because you know, right. usually it's, you know, you, there's going to be a few that drop out just yeah. based on the stats. Right. And then, like I said, to go six weeks and raise another 20 is, okay, there's, you know, because then you, 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 all the doubters are kind of gone by that point and they, they're like oh wow yeah i want to be in on this because i right. missed the first round right it's right. uh it's fascinating and to call this place home and be doing business in in oh, you know your home state and home city it's that's that's pretty cool it's it, pretty be proud of it right it's it's just yeah, well i mean you know i'm riding a wave of great people around me uh oklahoma mm -hmm. is a incredible wave right now i think you and i were chatting when you walked in a while ago that gordon mm -hmm. ramsay's gonna open a restaurant at Chisholm Creek. Yeah. I'm like, okay. That's <laughs> if if you're just looking for little indicators of how well are we doing, right. that, that, I don't know how big that is, but that feels like a pretty good indicator. Yeah. You know? There's going to be people queuing around the block just to hear Gordon Ramsay say the F word. I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just, it doesn't matter about his food. They just want to be around him when, when he starts yelling at his staff. <laughs> but it's fascinating and, and it's a lot of fun to see and, and you know, just I mean, what about the other stuff that gets you kind of going outside of the business? I mean, we've talked a lot about kind of your business, kind of, uh, you know, the work that you've done through Ditchwich and, and Magellan and, and on, obviously now Cotado. But what about the other stuff that, you know, when you get a little bit of success, I mean, you mentioned buying a lake house, but you could have gone anywhere, right? And I right. say this a lot to people on the podcast, like, what keeps you here? You know, what, what, yeah. what keeps you grounded? What keeps you pushing to well, work harder and, and you for know, sure, success? It, I mean, it's probably like, got to be 99% of everybody talked to, it's family, right? Yeah. And so uh, we lost our youngest son about two years ago. It, uh, that, that, uh, I don't care who you are, that's, that's about as bad as it'll get. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, thankfully it, it sort of gelled our family instead of splitting it apart. And uh, it, I don't I don't blame families for it splitting it apart. I mean, it's just what happened and how how do you deal with it? And so we've become really close. And so um, I don't mind chatting about it because my wife and I both agreed uh, if we're chatting about it, that's a way to celebrate him. So he was three three days shy of his thirtieth. Yeah. I don't even mind crying about it. You know, I just don't. But we now have a lake house, and it's fantastic. And we didn't know that, but we bought this lake house, and I could have been a few weeks later. We find out we're going to have a granddaughter. So. Yeah. Life works in weird ways, doesn't it? Yeah. It shows you signs that. I mean, you, you know, there's there's ways to look at them and there ways there ways to not look at them. But, you know, a product of that is is a grandson and and also bringing the family together. Which, sadly, through tough times, that's usually what happens, yeah. isn't it? You know, you've got to go through something really bad for the family to be better and closer. And, you know, there's so many things that you see every day that that your son lives on through and reminds yeah. you of little things that that you know funny things he did bad oh, things yeah. he did things that made you bad things that oh, made yeah. you so you know laugh so much i'm sure there's there's little things you guys talk yeah. about we've always been a, a pretty a very tight family traveled a lot uh spent a lot of money on vacations mm -hmm. that if i was probably a little more financially astute i might not have done that yeah. and now i'm so glad i did because i'm like damn yeah what would you have done right so part of the reason we bought the lake house, it was kind of like, what are we saving our money for? Uh -huh. You know, let's go enjoy, uh -huh. you know, what we have, you know. And so, you know, my son and other son and daughter-in-law, uh, the one that getting ready to have our granddaughter, uh -huh. you know, I, it just makes me feel so good. They want to go out and like this last weekend, they're like, we're going to go spend the weekend at the lake house. And my wife, I'm like, yeah, yes. that's yeah. what it's for, right? Yeah. Uh, Bought a boat that, because of supply and demand, won't be here till this fall. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I'm looking forward to that. You know, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna name the boat after our first our that's awesome. son that passed away. So, you know, that's yeah. that's the stuff that holds holds me together mm -hmm. the most. Uh, I was out at that lake for Fourth of July last year, and it was very good. Well, that's all we hear about, it's and I've never seen it. Everybody goes, "Wait till Fourth of July yeah. rolls around." Mm -hmm. So. I don't know if it's that great or people just drink enough beer that they uh, think true. it's great. So. Yeah, people setting off, everybody's setting off fireworks, <laughs> and then there is a good fireworks show. Um, but uh, I guess finishing up, what kind of, um, you know, what would you say, I guess, to, I don't know, someone who's coming out of college now that, I mean, there's two questions here. If someone's going to be an entrepreneur, what would you say to them? And then the other one would be, if they want to get in the corporate world, what would you say to them? So Yeah. Uh, well, you know, oddly enough, it's almost a little different. Uh if you're going to go in the corporate world, um, whatever you do, be great at it. You know, I took a lot of weird little jobs in my corporate world, and all my buddies like David, that's a that's a dead end deal. And I, you know, sort of that classic Oki thing. I'm like, well, hold my beer. I'm going to make this the coolest job in the company. You know, and I'd get there and I'd have fun and we'd get results and. And so being great at wherever you're stuck is a pretty good goal. And as a result, I never asked for a promotion. I for sure never asked to be CEO. I just sort of got pulled up. And I think it's because wherever I went, I was pretty nice and we got results. And that was always my deal. Be nice and get some results. Yeah. And so if you're going into the corporate world, I'd say do that. Uh, entrepreneur. You know, you're your own boss, right? So I, th I guess the advice I'd give to them is surround yourself with the right kind of people that can give you advice. Don't let your ego take over. Don't think you understand it. Mm -hmm. Just ask as many questions from everybody that will listen to you. Um, and that, that's something I had to learn because my, I didn't think I had an ego, but I think early on I didn't ask enough questions. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, like recently we had a had a real estate thing bubble up that I'm like, I think I know what I'm gonna do, but I reached out to three financial experts that I know in my world hmm. and said, Here's what I'm looking at, what do you think? And they'd ask me great questions that I would have never thought of myself. And so to an entrepreneur I'd say, 
don't don't let your ego get ahead of you. Just keep asking questions. Some of it's bad <laughs> feedback, but you'll know. You'll know. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking um, 40 minutes of your day to sit with us and share some stories. Um, excited to kind of keep an eye on the venture the venture stuff and see yeah. the, the projects that's going. And uh, for people listening, I'll post the links to both businesses in the description. You can go check those out if you are listening and you're one of those people who wants to get involved and invest in you know, Oklahoma, then, uh, then I'll hit the links in the description and we will catch you next episode. Cheers. This podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, telling Oklahoma stories through its people since 1927. Follow them online at oklahomahof.com and definitely on Instagram at oklahomahof. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, Follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.